Well, I'm only a technologist in the sense that I apply technology to thinking about how we apply it toward tactics. And I've, I'd like to summarize my talk before I go into about a 15 to 20 minute discussion and then open it up for questions, comments, because what I really learned is that the discussion part of any talk is really the most important part when you all start thinking about how to apply it or challenge what I'm about ready to say. Summarizing, what we're seeing in the new advanced technologies that is occurring, whether you're talking about hypersonics, whether you're talking about quantum physics, uh, whether you're talking about uh, robotics and autonomy, whether you're talking about unmanned systems, is an enhancement of the offensive capability, the natural offensive capability of naval forces. That means that you can apply those much cheaper with much less risk. Therefore, that implies something for the defense because the American Navy still needs to be able to maintain sea lines of communication. What it implies for the defense is we're doing it wrong. Our precision weapons against precision weapons are extremely expensive when we have to revisit essentially how we do that. We also have to think about new ways of fighting or old ways of fighting or returning to old ways of fighting of accepting that the autonomous system, whether it's manned or unmanned, is capable of executing both defense and offense in totally self-reliant capability. That is not network warfare. That is network optional warfare. And so now I like to show or try to build some of those thoughts together. Uh, the first thing is this. There is no other service, maybe the Air Force, uh, giving a nod to, to uh, Dr. Blake, maybe the Air Force has the same issue that we do, but essentially there's nothing like technology that will drive Navy tactics. It's sort of a chicken and egg sort of thing. Our technology and our tactics show gaps. Uh, we are, the enemy's uh, technology shows gaps. We invent what new technology or we see emerging capability. We see opportunity and we grab that opportunity and we reinvent the tactics. Uh, by the way, that's called opportunity-based, uh, uh, op uh, not requirements-based, and that is a whole different thing. You all are in the business of opportunity-based uh, acquisition or at least opportunity-based capabilities, not necessarily requirements-based. If I have to wait to see an enemy emerging in technology, that's requirements. I'm always behind the power curve. You all are in a stronger business. You are going to give me the opportunities to change these tactics. But throughout history, we've actually named these ages of these technologies because they imply certain ways in which we employ forces at sea. Everything from the ram to the gun to the aircraft to the missile, but the new technologies now that we're calling are emerging the capabilities of the robotics age. The robotics age in enabling both manned and unmanned system capabilities and to employ those at sea has certain implications. And of course, again, that gives us the tactical edge. And I am a tactician, and I'm not an apologist for this. Uh, I frequently go to the War College at their strategic forums, and they ask me to speak. And the reason why is because I believe in no other service like the Navy does tactics give you that technical edge. That te technical and tactical edge gives you oper operational and strategic capabilities. When you're talking about in ways and means for strategy, tactics is the ways and the means part of that, and you are definitely in that sort of business. This doesn't change, though. As long as we ship things across the ocean, there are two main missions for the Navy, and that does not change. Either one is sea control, meaning making sure that we're able to get our goods and services across, whether it's a peacetime or contested sea, in order to be able to conduct power projection if it's a wartime environment, or sea denial, that is keeping the enemy from doing those very same things. Those two things don't change for the roles of the Navy, and those are the constants that have been around since we put men and women to sea. However, our fleet has changed. Uh, throughout the Cold War, we were interested in both sea control and power projection. The Soviet Union had the capability to conduct sea denial operations across the Atlantic, and in certain cases in World War II, of course, uh, we had that challenge in the Pacific as well. But as our fleet drew down and as peace broke out in the late 18, uh, 1980s, uh, essentially we were, suddenly owned the oceans. Our fleet then could focus on power projection. Large aircraft carriers became very cost effective as far as capabilities, putting it all in one area uh, because you could launch those and you could have them sea bases and they were uncontested. Uh, it makes sense, by the way, I'm going to get off on a little tangent here, but it makes sense in peacetime to build a highly capable multi-mission warship, absolutely, because I can put more capability in a single hull. It's cost-effective to do that. In wartime, 
It's exactly the opposite. If I want a resilient force, that's a lot of eggs in one basket. The other comment I want to make before I go any further is everything I'm about ready to say about the U.S. Navy is true for the PLA and and for the Soviet, or excuse me, there's a flashback, the Russian <laughs> Navy as well. That is, they recognize these technologies as well. This is a two-way street when we talk about conflict. We're not talking about just opportunity in naval operations for the U.S. Navy. We're talking about opportunity for potential adversaries. And in that case, how we respond to that is just as important as how we respond to our own uh, ability to capture those technologies. For the land warfare uh, warriors uh, in the room, you know that there's a concept called three to one. Three to one is, is defense. That is, you have to have three times the combat capability to overcome a, a if you're in the offense, to overcome a defense. That means for land warfare, defense is the strongest form of warfare. It is a stronger form of warfare than offense. That's exactly the opposite in maritime warfare. In fact, that basic observation drives so much of the difference of the way the services think, it's unbelievable. If we are able to, both historically, um, uh, it's, it's confirmed, if we're able to attack effectively first, especially in pulse warfare, whether you have torpedoes or missiles or unmanned systems, you normally are the winning side. On the other hand, defense is the easiest form of operational capability. So at the tactics, uh, offense is a stronger form of warfare. At the operational level, defense is easier to employ. That is, sea denial is easier to employ. Let me make this uh, uh, tactically um, uh, relevant. So if you think about it for a minute, it's much easier to build a missile to hit a ship than it is a missile to hit a missile. Well, and because of that, uh, it's much cheaper to build offensive capability at maritime warfare than it is defensive capability. Likewise, if you're talking about sea denial, that is you're focused on just denying the oceans, at the operational level, it's much easier to build something to deny ships the capability of, of sea control than it is to actually establish that sea control. Uh, if for those strategists in the room, uh, this is sort of a Mahan, Mahanian versus Corbett debate, although that's not really fair to Mahan because he addressed these uh, areas as well. But essentially what it means is that we may be on the wrong side of this and have been for many years. We've been building advanced missiles to defeat missiles, where our adversaries have been building a lot of missiles to attack us. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, at the operational level, we have to maintain sea control and we're trying to, to push into an area where it's much easier and cheaper to build a missile uh, that, that actually uh, takes on a ship uh, than it is to build those ships to actually establish that control capability. This is just an example of the sea denial, uh, just examples of sea denial range rings from our adversaries from uh, DIA's unclassified sources. And what it really means is we're facing now a challenge going into the operating areas. What does this mean for the robotics age? <clears throat> well, in the first place, if you can build many things very cheap, uh, then in that case, uh, I've got the uh, enhance that power of quality already enhances the capability of the offense. It means that I can build a lot of capability mm -hmm. Uh, and, and a lot of challenge for you to defend an enlarged swarm type environment. Uh, so let me t t highlight a couple of these bullets. Um, first, I, I come up with harpies and swarms. Uh, Harpy was a uh, uh, Israeli based developed uh, uh, unmanned uh, combatant aerial vehicle uh, bought by the Chinese and improved. Uh, it is now uh, sort of a <laughs> A, a semi-autonomous capability, which is simply a, a, a harm uh, 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 seeker head that finds SPY-1 radars and just attacks them independently. Well, that's no problem. You can, these things are only 200 knots. I can shoot these down all day. Not a problem at all. 55 of them come at me, no problem, for the DDG. 105, I can take. I start to run out of weapons. I start to run out of SM2s. And that's the problem is if I can build enough capability in these offensive systems, what happens is that it's actually cheaper to actually increase my offensive capability in a way that's already advantage. Likewise, because of that offensive capability, I can build high-low mix uh, intelligence surveillance capability so that I might have satellites at the same time I have a fishing boat or an unmanned sailboat. 
sitting out there radiating, and I have a lot of them because they're inexpensive to do. That's a challenge when an adversary presents that to me. Uh, whether you're empowered through individual or group autonomy, that also enhances the capabilities of the offense. And it's, what I meant by less risk on aggressive offense is if I have manned, unmanned system capability and I send my, send my unmanned systems forward, it means it's less risky on the manned side to conduct this level of offense. It allows me also to look at incrementalism. That is, I can employ a couple of unmanned old aircraft, piloted vehicles out there at a, a potential adversary, or that adversary does it to me, and I have to, to actually focus on that before the highly technical and tactical and capable uh, anti-ship missiles come and attack in the second wave. The other option that we have, we face, and so does our adversaries, is we can build two types of unmanned systems, or both. We can build advanced autonomous systems like large diameter UUVs to do certain missions, or we can build multiple unmanned systems like sonobuoys in order that are difficult to defeat but are smart. And so we face that challenge because each can be employed in different ways and each can be enhanced or enhance this tactical advantage. Some of the enabling trends that we have and we're seeing is first the terrestrial's influence on maritime warfare. Uh, when you're talking about uh, ballistic missiles capable of targeting and hitting ships, that means that I can have an influence in the maritime warfare and not use a ship. Let me say that again. The most influential uh, weapon system that's been introduced in the last 10 years, in my view, is the DF-21 for us. Why? Because it's a terrestrial land-based missile capable of long reach further than our tactical aircraft can fly. And if that's the case, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, that sea denial is inexpensive and much easier than sea control. The other is that high-low mix that I talked about before. If I'm going into an environment where I both have to worry about satellites, high-altitude aircraft, and thousands of fishing boats, then I have a real challenge on how to defeat that ISR. And that implies the way I'm going to fight both operationally at the tactical level. Uh, this also means that uh, for us in the United States, we still maintain that undersea advantage. Uh, that becomes more important than the surface and air advantage that we're currently investing in. It also means that I'm going to reinforce this in that last bullet, C4 ISR becomes critically important for both teams. That means who can find the person first and shoot first has the advantage. That doesn't necessarily mean it, doesn't, it needs to be a technical solution. It just might mean that that fishing boat making one burst of AF, uh, HF transmission locates my carrier fast enough that they can get a missile launch off from shore. And that's the sort of thing that we have to worry about today. Now, I sort of threw these in here because these, are another, uh, these technologies, as they emerge, may also impact our ability uh, both to defend and defeat or use them to our advantage. Uh, hypersonic weapons, if you're talking about range and speed, uh, they increase that offensive capability again. Uh, the potential for quantum sensing to increase that uh, uh, warning time that I might have in order to react or quantum computing, uh, the ability to quickly react to these type of threats is an important advantage as well. I'm going to develop the last bullet uh, a little bit more fully here, but I referred to it before. If I continue to be, uh, build missiles to defeat missiles or bullets to defeat bullets, I might be on the wrong uh, side of the equation here. Instead, I'm very interested in old barrage type weapons. I'm not talking about flechettes, I'm talking about electromagnetic capability to defeat these swarms as they come in, uh, to do, actually challenge uh, their autonomy, challenge their sensor capability uh, through using, in some sense, uh, electronic weapons in order to do that. This is the other thing that we have to think about that has implications as well. If you go far enough on this, and I, I referred to this in my summary, we are no longer a network-centric force. If we do, we build our own vulnerability into our systems, and that's what we have to be careful about. Every technology you introduce, every concept we introduce, has the adversary that's watching this and say, how am I going to defeat this? So if I rely on that long-range ISR sensor to provide my entire battle group information, and I lose that link or lose that ISR sensor, I built in my own critical vulnerability. I have to watch out for that and I have to think about how to make network-enabled forces, not network-required forces. That is, when I have the network, great. When I don't, I can fight autonomously. And all this goes down to who can fight best in the EM night. That is, if I deny the adversary PNT and they deny me PNT and we deny each other communications, 
who can fight best, ship on ship, platform on platform, by ourselves. I maintain we have a cultural advantage there, a long shot. Cultural advantage as far as our war fighters go. But we have to enable those captains, those ships, and those unmanned systems, working with those in order to allow them to fight autonomously, meaning that they have their own organic capability to conduct ISR, their own organic capability to do computer processing for decision support, and their own organic capability to launch that weapon, whether they're an aircraft, whether they're a surface ship, or whether they're a submarine. This is what I meant by pushing that CS4, uh, CS, uh, C4 ISR at the lowest uh, possible level and the sense that we want to conduct quiet operations. Essentially, today, if you're found in Navy warfare, you're destroyed. That is, you're targeted, you're capable of being launched against, you're automatically at that disadvantage. Because of that, the wonderful systems that we built in our Aegis spy and around spy you have to start questioning that technology and say, is that the way we are going to fight in the future? Uh, and particularly with a large adversary that has designed forces specifically against that coordination system. So think more of how, of how we did submarine ops in World War II. We set a submarine in a particular area. We said, that's your area. Deny the enemy that adversary or the adversary's uh, passage of that area. And then we fought our way in as we started conducting large scale sea denial operations. So this is sort of a concept of employment and I'll show you the implications for a fleet uh, because of this. One is you send your many forces forward. That means your uh, unmanned manned systems, I believe in operating in pairs in that one uh, as much as possible. Uh, you send uh, mini ISR forward and you send offensive capability forward. So as, uh, as you send those forward, you send things that you can uh, put at risk. You send those things that allow you to employ that offensive capability uh, while at the same time you have to retain your traditional sea control forces to ensure that your logistics get through. So the little picture over there in the right or the lower uh, left hand side sort of shows the sea denial area that we're concerned with now and the fact that we have to push on through that in order to maintain logistics. What does this mean for the fleet? Well, uh, this is not a secret uh, as far as, excuse me for a second, one of the worst things that can happen to a professor is they lose their voice. That happened to me last week. So I was actually ridiculed for having to use a mic because usually I don't have to. Um, we have, to, if you think about it, this also, this also, call, this almost calls for a bimodal type fleet, a fleet in which we are, are uh, have a sea denial fleet focused on the offense. That means um, many unmanned systems, manned manned systems, uh, capable of operating under sea and on the surface and in the air to actually impose, impose the same level of threat that our adversaries are thinking about imposing on us now. But likewise, because the U.S. Navy is a global force and because our primary job in, in, in many of the um, uh, large scenario campaigns is to ensure sea control, we also have to look at that more expensive side with our traditional forces. That is, we have to be able to punch through once we actually conduct those sea denial capabilities. So this ha actually has implications for two ways to build the fleet and to operate the fleet in forward areas and as we work our way across in major um, uh, operational constructs. Well, this sort of the last couple slides I have sort of gets to the meat of the things. What does this mean for you? What does it mean for you as you go and look for opportunities for the fleet itself? It's that look for those opportunities that enhance both my capability to conduct ISR and to deny ISR. That means decoy operations, deception operations, uh, EM denial in some way. Some way in which I can uh, impose risk, uncertainty into the potential adversary's uh, C4 ISR systems, however that is. Uh, I can also take a look at, uh, or need to take a look at strong uh, offensive to detect to engage sequence. And what does that mean? I know some of you are working on uh, uh, machine learning, uh, advanced optimization capabilities, uh, decision tools to support uh, for the warfighter. All those help with decision time. So if I have information, then can I use it and can I decrease my areas of uncertainty to attack as quickly as possible? I personally uh, hope we never get into a major conflict with an adversary. But if we do, for the near-peer adversaries that are emerging and threaten, we have to revisit our precision weapons concept. And what I mean by that is, at what level of, of, um, of certainty am I going to launch 
a particular type of weapon, uh, particularly if it's a long-range anti-ship missile. Today, I have a certain level of an area of uncertainty for my precision weapon that I'm going to use because I rely on certain levels of precision navigation and, and timing. If I don't have those, am I willing to send three missiles down range on a line of bearing only? And I maintain yes, because if they are quiet and I'm quiet, and I force them to radiate because they see a threat coming at them, I now have the advantage. That's using a missile as a seduction decoy to act actually create their activity. Now, if you build me a missile that's not really a missile that does the same thing, that's going to help out the warfighter quite a bit. And that is essentially, I want to make them radiate. I want to make them in, uh, initiate communications before I do. So if I'm able to do that either in counter C4SI or you help me out with the decision uh, time uh, and in increase that offensive weapons capability and effectiveness, that's what we're looking for. Uh, the other thing, of course, is technologies, again, to, for the defensive detect to engage sequence. And what I mean by that is now that I have potentially swarms of offensive capability coming at me, whether that's on the surface, under sea, or in the air, how can I now not just count my missiles in my cells? How, if I've only got 90 shots, I'm going to be weapons limited. So I've got to think of new ways in order to defeat these capabilities, not just to see them coming, but in fact either take them down, either electronically or physically, so which means that I can rely on uh, weapon systems that are not necessarily uh, inventory limited, like lasers, or uh, weapon systems that rely or intercept electronic uh, sensing capabilities like EM burst or EM capabilities. Those are the sort of things I need to actually help that barrage capability uh, in order to help me. Likewise, quicker decision time. So if you're looking, uh, working on, on uh, those capabilities, when I sense that information, I'm able to, to see or assess the threat and then employ these weapon systems that I'm developing as quickly as possible. That helps me with the defense uh, in the detect to engage sequence. And then, of course, the self-sufficiency side that I addressed before, both on the offense and the defensive side. Self-sufficiency means that you have to build those, uh, those decision aids, that ML, that, uh, uh, that, that focused uh, intelligence or artificial intelligence in each one of my firing platforms. Each one has to have that self-sufficiency capability in order to deploy those particular weapon systems for me to be effective and resilient force. Now, this is the last thought I want to leave with you because it's sort of uh, uh, interesting. And that is many of the things we worry about today, as far as our adversaries go, you invented in the 1960s. And then we didn't use it, but the other guys did. I'm worried about anti-ship ballistic missiles. We had that technology a long time ago. I'm worried about wake homing tor tor torpedoes. We had that technology a long time ago. But we didn't employ it. So what we need is not just technology, emerging technology that presents an opportunity, but one that sometimes is so basic, so analog, that in fact, the digital age cannot c compete with it. And a perfect example here, of course, is that traffic circle versus a smart light that goes out. Okay, I, was, I kept my uh, comments specifically sort of brief on purpose because hopefully I inspired some thought or at least was slightly contentious. Uh, I certainly, the CNO thinks it's slightly contentious. Uh, uh, actually, N98 thinks it's slightly contentious. <laughs> <coughs> I'll be specific. Uh, but any comments or questions that you might have? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that I thought your logic chain was excellent and very compelling. Um, and I wanted to ask you about a public debate that was recently underway about retiring one of our carriers early in exchange for large numbers of unmanned systems. And I'd like to just hear your opinion on that. Right, well, I, I'm, I'm heavily biased on this particular opinion. By the way, I'm an analyst, of course, by trade now, a warfare analyst. And there's an old saying that says that there is no such thing as an unbiased analyst unless they're ignorant. And that makes sense. Your best analyst is ignorant of the problem. They have to gather information. But as they gather information, they become biased. I've been gathering information on this for the last 15 years. If I early retire a carrier, I free up 5,000 sailors. 
I free up the O&M costs. Instead of one target, I'm capable of building hundreds of targets. Even if I don't commission one DDG, I can build 35 <laughs> missile ships and add 800 missiles to an environment where I've only got 90 on that DDG. It's all about the missiles, not about the platforms anymore. And we have got to change that discussion. Now, when I say missiles, I broaden that discussion to uh, uh, any type of weapon system that can be employed that's not platform dependent. And right now, the three-stage system that we call an aircraft carrier, because it is three-stage, it's even four-stage if you count the shore support, right? Shore support, aircraft carrier, aircraft, missile. I just want to focus on the missile. In fact, one of the problems we've had, well, not problems, one of the things we have to mature away from is thinking about platforms employing systems. What I want to do is start with that missile or that weapon system hitting the adversary and work backwards and find out the best way to employ that. And that currently is not an aircraft carrier anymore. My opinion. <laughs> you bet. It was a great talk. I really enjoyed it and kind of can resonate on a lot of that stuff. Uh, wh what if there is no forward? And I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I don't really believe in this, the bad guys are on the left and the good guys are on the right, and circles and all the, you know, island chains and all that. You know, I think it's more likely there's it's going to be all around you in, in different places, unexpected sure. and situations where, you know, um, and then they, everyone knows that, I think. I don't think that, I, I, it's easy to draw a line, a demarcation line, and say, we're gonna be over here, and they're gonna be over here, and then we're gonna do all these things. But what if there is no forward, and it's just kind of everywhere, and behind you, and it could only be a few, you know, platforms, it but that's, that's all right. it takes. That's right, and that's all it takes because it's how they can get those missiles or those torpedoes forward. So it, it's a great question. Uh, I have frequently have my class I asked them a question, how many of you are familiar with the term port breakout? That, yeah, you got to be pretty old, Larry, to know that term. <laughs> My lieutenants don't know that term because they don't think about it, right? There's entire procedures for if there is a Russian, I got it right that time, if there is a Russian or Chinese submarine that's threatening one of our CONUS-based uh, ships or our ports or Hawaii port, or a port in Europe, do we still know how to actually maintain sea control long enough to get those capabilities out? That is, conduct ASW. Worse, if it's not a submarine, if it's a large diameter UUV, what have we built in order to do that? By the way, some of our students right now, some of our students are studying uh, uh, undersea infrastructure. And guess what the most effective thing against a large diameter UUV is? A fence, right? And sometimes getting that traffic circle solution can be just as important as the most advanced one. So yes, you're absolutely correct. We need to start thinking about Cold War, in fact, some cases, World War II type operations and apply them to the new technologies today. Uh, and Port Breakout is a perfect example of that. That's how you actually start to clear the water, how you start to get a Q route, uh, the, the systems for quickly uh, 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 searching for that. Um, and the level of effort you need for the lower the risk in order to, before you send logistics out, whether that's a carrier or whether it's an oiler. Great question. Jeff, thank Yeller. you. Uh, great talk. Clearly, uh, Captain Hughes has uh, infused all of his knowledge into you, and, and you've carried it even further. You know, I think about Admiral Roughhead canceling DDG-1000 as probably the greatest act of courage inside the Beltway you know, at least in the Navy in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, I don't think you have many people in this room that would argue with where you're going. I mean, it's the geeks versus the rest of the Navy. Where are the antibodies and where do you see those eventually going, yeah. uh, you know, in the five-sided wind tunnel and, and elsewhere? I had about five thoughts during your comment. Um, first, um, um, here are, the, here are the challenges to changing the Navy. Uh, first is the Navy's not in charge of building the Navy. In the Constitution, uh, the legislative process in Congress is specifically tasked with maintaining a Navy. 
They take that very seriously. For the second reason, because building a high capital ships is capital intensive and it provides jobs in certain areas. If you read the book by Ian Toll, 13 frigates, it's been that way since we started building our first 13 frigates. Arguing where the ships were gonna be built, the 13 were built all over the place for political purposes. Who was gonna captain them? Big po politics uh, issues. So after, so there's politics involved, uh, there is um, uh, economics involved. There's also something called, um, uh, you know, just the fact that you have capital intensive investment. So retiring an aircraft carrier is sort of a big deal. You spent billions of dollars on it. Well, economists would say, ah, oh, that's sunk cost. But to American taxpayer, that's a large capital investment. And it's hard to change large capital investments. So that's uh, the problem. Uh, another problem is the fact of the way we do the PBB system. Now, okay, I was in OSD. I've lived the PBE system before. I'm an analyst. It makes sense. It's logical, uh, but it's also marginal. And what I mean by that, it does not inspire great innovation. It inspires marginal change. Uh, let me describe that. If I look at the DPG scenarios that we currently plan and uh, focus our forces on, because of the cost constraints that we have, I can only build sufficient forces to respond <coughs> to those scenarios. If I build sufficient forces to respond to those scenarios, and everything's a lesser case, right? Wrong. Why is that? Because you have to input the adversary in this. In 2011, Secretary Danzig made a great comment. He said, we've never fought anywhere we had planned on fighting. And what he was talking about was the DPG scenarios. But think about it for a minute. If you build a force structure to counter what you think is the worst and most challenging scenario, guess what won't happen? You will effectively deter that scenario. Our actions shape the very future that occurs. Therefore, the adversary builds things to counter that. So because we have a marginal system, now the fourth, or fifth or final thing, I forgot to which count it was, it is the natural and important and healthy purview of admirals to be risk adverse. It's important for admirals to be risk adverse. There's no saying that admirals win, uh, can only lose wars, and they can. If they lose the fleet and lose the sea lines of communication, nobody's fighting forward. So what worked, what they feel comfortable with, is an important aspect. Lieutenants in battles have to win wars. Admirals have to make sure we don't lose them. Because of that, they're naturally risk adverse. And we see that large, capital-intensive, existing navies only change in time of crisis. What do I mean by that? If you take a look at prior to World War II, we were emerging. We had aircraft carriers. We're talking about naval aviation. But we were talking about naval aviation supporting the battle line of the battleships. Submarines were going to be the advanced ISR capability for those battleships. World War II hit. All those roles changed. Guess what the number one combatant we built was as after the war started? Anyone know? The number one combatant. Patrol boats. 1,500 of them, as many as we could get out. We wanted to get those torpedoes, today's missiles, out as quickly as possible and as forward as possible, and that was the fastest way to do it. Yes, we built ca some capital ships. Yes, we built carriers. Uh, we built that carrier capability up. But we built 1,500 small combatants, and we built another uh, 500 destroyers to build something quick to get it out there. The other thing that I wanted to write on your comment is I'm not too much of a pessimist when it comes to this. And the reason why is this. Because of what you're doing and what you're investing in, if it's never transitioned, it's on the shelf. And if we can grab it fast enough and transition us in time of crisis, that's what we want to be able to do. So I'm frustrated many times in my own research programs when they're not accepted or they don't make that technology leap, but they're on the shelf and they're ready to go. I'm sorry, that's a long answer to your question, Larry. But Yes, sir. I was just curious, has the stand-up of our new Space Force started to influence the concept of operations of naval forces in the fleet? I'm going to admit ignorance on that. Uh, I don't know. What I'm concerned about is space, being, space ISR being denied to us, space communications being denied to us, uh, whether that is um, in the host of different ways in which that can be done. I don't necessarily mean kinetic kills. I mean interference with our own C4I capabilities. Um, 
I don't think we'll ever be denied them, but I think in a way they'll be severely degraded to the point where the way we target precision weapons now, and we think about DIMPIs and mincerating targets, will become OBE because we won't be able to do that. And I want to make sure that our work, our war fighting force can quickly change and say, okay, fine. I asked my son once, he was an F-18 pilot, and I said, uh, hey, if I take all that stuff away from you, what's going to happen? He looked at me and said, you just have to accept more collateral damage. I can still bomb. I just need to know what the coordinates are. And we have to change that mindset. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, question with respect to your network-enabled forces versus right. the network-required forces. Uh, what trends do you see necessary and coming with respect to uh, delegation of traditionally human-held authorities? Yeah, what a great question. So um, let me first talk about the technologies on network-enabled and then um, uh, what trends that I think are human-held itself. Uh, network enable could be uh, mesh type computing, right? And short term burst mesh, com uh, com I said computing, I'm sorry, communications. So if we can set up mesh type networks locally uh, where has brief communication bursts, we might be able to build at least an organic capability to cover the area that I assign certain forces to deny those capabilities. When I do that, then I have to think about the weapons release authority. Is that what you're ref referring to specifically? I'm sorry? Among other, yeah. Okay, well, I'll start with that one because it's probably uh, the easiest one. Uh, right now, we have a doctrine for that in DOD. It's quite clear there's going to be a human in the loop. There will probably still be a human in the loop, I think, even in, in all cases. But the question is when that decision is made. And if I create a geographic kill box, I can make that decision fairly early. Does that make sense? So I've said anything in this area is anything that meets certain characteristics, whether it's acoustic intelligence, whether it's electronic intelligence, uh, whatever, if that meets that criteria, kill it, then we haven't really jumped much forward from the, from the captor mine, which did the same thing. Captor mine, uh, sensed, we mined a field, sensed a certain type of uh, blade rate, uh, the 46 torpedo launched and attacked. So I don't see much evolution from that, particularly in a major conflict. Um, as far as AI and ML, um, I'm, um, I'm not a, a cynic by any stretch of the imagination. We need to uh, push as hard as possible on those capabilities. But if you think about the technologies for supervised learning and machine learning capabilities, it relies on historical data in many cases to teach that machine, right? And it uses random forest or regression techniques in order to do it. The bad guys think for themselves. And therefore, any ML solution we have to be careful of doesn't just cover the most likely case, it covers the most dangerous case. And the most dangerous case may be on the tails of that ML, but for the human who can think just as uh, innovatively as the other human, we have to insert that capability as well. So I'm a big proponent of ML and AI giving me as the decision maker solid advice from the historical perspective, but not making my decision for me. And mainly because of the bad guy, because those, those guys will think of ways in which to counter whatever they think I'm doing. Now, this is an interesting discussion. I didn't put this up on the board on purpose. If you think about this and you think our adversaries are going to rely on ML and they're using very similar techniques we're using, what kind of information that we can provide that would train their machines the way we want them to be trained? And we don't have a good program for that right now, unless you know something that I don't. Someone might be working. So what I'm talking about is disinformation to their machines at an early enough time to affect their supervised learning capabilities to think the way we want them to think, not the way that they want them to think. Great question. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the way you get your exercise this morning, right? <laughs> So, so very much along the lines of what you were talking about with where naval aviation and submarines were thought of as ISR for the battleships, we found a lot of our, our best path to transition is often when we can give uh, forces some of these technologies that they can initially use to continue doing things the way they do that and not try to both change technology and, and how they're doing 
their business at the same time. Right. And I'm just kind of curious, do you think that there is a good path for that with these technologies, or, or there's a point where it really is going to take a giant leap, and if we're not willing to make that leap, we're going to be in serious uh, Okay, trouble. so that you're, what you're hitting on is you're hitting on the weakness of my positive, this is an important point. You're hitting on the weakness of my positive point that, hey, we've got something on the shelf, and we're ready to go with it, right? And we throw it to the fleet, and the fleet goes, uh, that doesn't work, not the way I fight now. So, uh, yes, that is a real fear, and uh, here's how I personally counter it. One lieutenant, one major at a time that comes in my classroom. And I was describing this in my campaign analysis class. This is what I do. And I've been doing this for uh, every six months. And I invite all of you to participate in this. That's why it's important. Uh, every six months, I hold a joint campaign analysis class where I get operations research students, systems engineering analysis students, systems engineering students, operational logistics students, and some very brave business students uh, to come into the classroom. And what I do is I give them an operational scenario uh, for the future, it's a 2030, our current one's called Global War 2030, where we're fighting the Pacific, we're fighting in the Baltic, and we're fighting uh, in the Adriatic. Um, and then they have to come up with the program forces and they have to say, concept of operations for how to employ against the missions that you're assigned. So they do that. Then because they're all quants, they're all analysts, I have to say, now quantify our risk whether it's time, whether it's people, whether it's attrition or whatever, you're the, what you've come up with with our current program forces, where are the dangers? Then I give them technologies. And I say, here's the technology from ONR. Here's the technology from DARPA. Here's something from Boeing. How would you use it? How would you change your employment of concept? Quantify the risk. Does it decrease your risk? Or do you think that there's some TR level here that there's a challenge with? And then they try to quantify the actual impact of that based on changing the employment. I'll give a perfect example. It's the, uh, when we still had the ACTUV active, which is now the medium displacement unmanned service vehicle, the very original concept for that, if you might remember, was the ASW continuous trail unmanned vessel. And the concept was, and it was a bad concept, was that this thing would have a direct pass sonar, would sit on top of an SSK and hold it at risk. Makes sense. When it came to my class and I first introduced this, my lieutenants looked at it and went, well, okay, but I know a better way to do it. They said, what we really need is two or three of these things, one with an active sensor and two passive. And I set up then a bi-static bi or a tri-static sensor capability to quickly locate the submarine. And then I used the passive MDSRP in order to actually the pouncer for the submarine. Pretty good idea. So we sent that over our physics department, and they're working out the geometry now that's associated with it. As those lieutenants hopefully come back to be lieutenant commanders, uh, the, ma the majors to become uh, colonels, they started to think about these things already. And that's the value of the education. War College does something very similar. It's not the panacea. It's not, there's still a risk of what you're highlighting. But at least it's a counter to some of that thought process, starting to get them to think how to use these technologies. By the way, there's one other comment before the other question. Uh, in the Battle of Midway, there was several interesting um, uh, innovative applications of technology that hadn't been thought before. So what most people don't realize is the first air, well, the first aircraft to, the first aircraft to attack uh, Japanese forces on June 3rd was the United States, or the United States Army Air Corps uh, in bombers out of Midway. They did a great job confusing the Japanese. By the way, they didn't hit anything, but that's not important. What it, re what it sent the signal to the Japanese was we're located and we're now at risk. That's an important concept. The second attack occurred by PBYs that weren't originally built to hold torpedoes. In fact, the whole concept for a torpedo attack and mounting it on the wings came from a chief and a lieutenant who essentially strapped them on the wings and they made the attack. And that's the sort of thing I think we're going to see, but we have got to have those torpedoes available in order to make that happen. Yeah, question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, earlier on in your discussion, you mentioned that we have a cultural advantage over our adversary. Yeah. Could you explain or elaborate more on that, and is that cultural advantage changing? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like the first question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soft pedal the second one, right? So why do I say that? I think that because our society is based on an individual basis, 
that as we focus on the, the rights of the individual, we think of, of, of we inspire and uh, we, we, try to, we try to inspire the individual to do better, uh, and we try to keep the constraints on that individual as a minimum, then that's why I think we have a cultural advantage. It's a difference between um, um, the, the philosophy of, uh, of, so, of society first as opposed to the individual. Now that's a huge debate one way or the other, but regardless, uh, if, you're, if you're reared into an environment where um, uh, the, 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 the philosophy is society comes first before the individual, then you're different than if you are focused on the individual right. So therefore, I think our culture inspires innovation much faster than the alternate culture. Now, your second question is very, very insightful. This was a discussion I was having with the Deputy Secretary of Defense once. Um, I'm sorry, Deputy Secretary of the uh, Navy. She came to MPS and said, we need to inspire innovation within our forces. And I, I'm not shy, as you might imagine. And I stood up and said, no, ma'am, you do not. You do not need to inspire innovation in the Navy forces. We have so many type A personalities out there. I have not met a lieutenant yet, that didn't, or a chief yet, that didn't want to go full bore to what they thought was their mission. Ma'am, what you need to do is find the roadblocks to innovation and remove them, because that's what we're faced with now. And we have to take a serious look at those. And I think we're making steps in the right direction. Too slow, but again, uh, historically I'm a pessimist. The only way that fleets actually change is in the high times of crisis. And so that hasn't hit us yet, and maybe it'll be too late. Maybe there'll be a slow evolution where we'll slowly you know, erode uh, to five ships in the Navy, very advanced, um, and the rest of the world will be break up into regional hegemons. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around there on your question. I apologize. Thank you again. That was a great comment. Um, Larry and I worked a lot on innovation together, and we couldn't agree with you more. Um, final question for me from the day. I work a lot with the SWARM team here at ONR. Great. And I'm wondering how much activity you have with your students about thinking about how to employ in the most naval impactful way heterogeneous, um, multi-domain, offensive swarms of unmanned systems. Right. So uh, it's a great question. And I don't know if you're familiar with MPS's uh, joint uh, exercise, uh, or, uh, uh, J J JFIX. I'm trying to think of what the J stands for now. I thought it was joint the field experimentation program. Uh, but we actually take ideas from our faculty and researchers and we employ them at sea. So the, the swarm concept is a great, there's a great debate going on. I, I got to relate this story. Do you know who Dr. Tim Chung is? Who's DARPA, right? Well, he, his office, when he was a young, I like to say that, a young associate professor was right across from mine. And he comes over and he brings me this little UAV. And it's about that big. And it's a crawler that he developed uh, when he was um, uh, at Northwestern. And what this thing did, it, it flew around, it had a small camera on it, and it flew and it crawled. So it land, it would crawl, and then it would take back off again. Multi-domain capability, right? And this was 2006 time frame, 2003 time frame. Uh, so, I, so I said, well, how will we use this? Well, I knew exactly. At that time, we were doing a lot of maritime interdiction operations. And so I thought our maritime interdiction teams could fly these things around fly them around the ship, land them, actually do a little ISR before the boarding team comes on board. And uh, we called it, uh, now the friggin' thing's in the MPS Museum. That's how old I am. <laughs> but the point is, we took that program, and I say we, I mean MPS. I just come up with the problems and the ideas. They make it happen. We took that idea and built the initial swarms, and this is where the debate came in. So Tim, and rightly so, he's been very successful at this. He held the record for the number of swarms airborne uh, to cooperatively try to hit a flag at a certain point. That is, talking to each other, master-slave capability, resilience, all that stuff. And I said, Tim, just build me a dumb robot and a lot of them. It'll work. Well, that's not interesting to a scientist and only so. But that's what the harpy is. The harpy is not swarm activity. They just launch 50, and we've modeled this. They just go out and circle. They lock on as they see it. and. They come in not as a swarm, not as a, a together, but that's enough to make me go Winchester. So this is what the discussion comes. Why don't I battle swarms with swarms? And this is where Tim got involved, right? This is where, why don't I launch, instead of chaff launchers, I have a bunch of small UAV launchers. And I just want them kamikazes. I want them to go out there and hit the first thing they see. 
right? Not quite. The, the small UAVs that are coming at me or some. Because all I have to do is intercept the air light or have a small charge. I can't think of anything better, you know, well, you, you all are the experts in this one. If I can in some way uh, impose turbulence in a hypervelocity weapon that's a cruise, uh, that's a, a, a air breather, then potentially that might be a great way to use swarms in order to actually defeat a very high technical uh, capability. Um, but we have thought about it, and we have thought about um, we, most of the students, and I think the more traditional way. If I have a swarm attack, I want to overcome their defenses by coming as a simultaneous time on top from multiple axes. It's the same way you do a manned uh, war at sea strike, essentially. The question is, can I defend against that with another swarm? And that's an interesting question as well. You bet. See, that's what happens. When you, when you get old people, you get old sea stories, too, and old sailors. Yeah. So you, talk, you talked a lot about uh, some of the technologies, like uh, machine learning and, and uh, hypersonics, things like that. What about things such as like additive manufacturing? You know, you talk yeah. about you know war of attrition with missiles, right, but right. if you can just rebuild your navy on, on a dime board or have a completely disposable navy that only needs to survive yep. two to three days as opposed to twenty to thirty years, which is what we do right now, how does that change the equation? So it's a great question. It's a great operational issue, uh, and that is if I can build these small things rapidly forward, then that decreases my cost of keeping forces forward. And that's a great idea, but I'll give you another thought. I'll give you a strategic thought. If I can advance additive manufacturing and 3D, where I'm no longer reliant on labor overseas, and I can build anything I want here in the United States, do I still need to maintain sea lines of communication? Will the American people even care? Because if we're oil independent, energy independent, manufacturing independent. My grandmother would ask, what do we need the rest of the world for? That changes the very strategic basis of world powers. And if I can make that realization and share that technology so that everyone becomes, it's not a power grab anymore for either energy, food, or logistics, or manufacturing or labor, that can change the very nature of mankind. So if you're working on 3D printing, keep doing it. Wow, I didn't mean to that be a final one. But go ahead. There's one there and then. Sir, uh, one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, coming from earlier, question, do you do any studies at the classified level? So yes. Especially uh, with her comment, um, we could expand a lot on that if we change the Clearance up there. So here's, here's the challenge. Uh, MPS can go all the way to TSSCI. But because most of my students have secret uh, clearances, uh, if we're going to do something, we work at the secret. So again, I'll, I'll give you an example. At one time, uh, with the introduction of the DF-21 and HF radar, uh, Skywave radar by uh, China, we were taking a look at different aviation tactics, something that um, uh, that actually Halsey invented, the, the carrier raid, the fast in and fast out, right, uh, type tactics. Uh, the class got that as a tactic and showed that if you did that and worried about um, the Skywave radar countering Skywave radar, uh, you would expose your cumulative threat in exposure would be very, very high. That was the unclassified level. Well, naturally, um, the air boss was very interested in that. So we moved that directly to the secret level. Um, and uh, that particular student that did that work in my class with his group actually made that his thesis and demonstrated, again, the cumulative threat was quite high. Uh, just based on the, if you're in a certain region, it's very challenging to do that. The problem is if you go any higher than that, if you go to TSSCI, then you lose almost all the students, and, except for the intel students, uh, and uh, intelligence students, I'm sorry, um, and only about 10% of the faculty. So, uh, which makes sense because you don't want your entire workforce there. So if you're going to leverage TSSCI capability for quantification, uh, then I would be doing the work personally. Uh, our, our technical and space operations people usually take up the rest of that. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 It'd be nice uh, if we could come expand on that a lot, uh, different classification. Sure. No, absolutely. And we can hold JWICs, uh, VT, uh, VTCs, if we call JWICs VTCs, or secret VTCs, no problem at all. Nice. Now, yeah. I'll throw out that one slide you had there, that picture, uh, where it showed where you're looking at the battle space. Yeah. You have about tens of thousands of autonomous weapon systems already forward deployed yes, wearing I, this uniform. Yes, we do. So uh, a nice mindset we try to have here is the naval fight. So look at instead of the capital ship fighting, hey, how can we influence it the same way they're influencing us? So uh, in fact, our last study, uh, Major Josh Fawcett is working with program manager, anti-ship missile program manager for the Marine Corps, specifically to parameterize and simulate that picture that you just saw. And we're conducting a war game in the first of June to answer those questions. I just briefed uh, General Wortman last week uh, and General uh, Bowers, uh, actually General Wortman the week before, General Bowers last week uh, on these concepts that are developing out of McWill and out of Marine Corps University. So absolutely. The Marines are back into sea denial. Out of the desert, back to the sea. So it seems like part of our issue is, is an inability to balance different types of risk. You know, we're desperately afraid that a small UAV might accidentally poke someone's eye out, mm -hmm. and we can't compare that to the risk that we might be overwhelmed by an adversary uh, doing these kinds of things. As someone in operations research department, just curious if you have any thoughts about uh, an evidence-based way that we could make that argument better. Wow. Wow. Um... Yeah, the problem is if you poke the eye out that I'm completely reliant on, I'm very concerned. So what I mean by that, if I take a 100 pound charge from a harpy and take it in my panels on a DDG that I'm relying for theater ballistic missile defense of, you, of the air base at Osaka, for example, then that risk is high. Does that make sense? Because I built my own vulnerability, which torques me off. But regardless, the, the equivalent is a huge amount, right? And that is, the other thing is that the, the likelihood, you have to worry about the likelihood in these risks too, right? So Iran can threaten, for example, my panels on my Aegis radar. Uh, China can threaten my entire fleet. So the question is, which is the higher likelihood that might occur? Those things are in discussions as well uh, at, at the operational. That's the frustrating aspect that you're talking about. Um, but the way we quantify most of those is the second and order effects of a smaller attack on a certain area. What we're looking for is those small vulnerability areas that we ourselves have that we don't want to have. Does that answer your question? Or maybe I didn't get it. Well, actually, I was even going a little bit more literally with that. For example, we have exceedingly strict rules on the use of small UAVs, for example, which NPS, of course, is oh, yeah. very familiar with. And there's not really any attempt to compare that to what we're losing because an immense number of people in the Department of Navy will not have experience with small UAVs as a yeah. result. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. No, no, I love that comment and that observation. If I were king, we'd take the tongue of the ocean, we'd give a lot of money to the Bahamas, and that would be our free airspace. And I'd rotate forces down there all the time in order to do exactly uh, what you're talking about. Or San Clemente on the West Coast. And I would, I would say, this is my airspace, and rotate people through to get those, the experience in defense and offense in this area. We're going to have to do this with testing ranges anyway. Yes, ma'am. Right. With, with live forces, the standoff distance is so far mm -hmm. that we're really not understanding the utility of those vehicles. Oh, anymore. right. We're not allowed to come within such a distance of the ship right. or any other craft right. that we're really not able to legitimately experiment and understand their utility. We, we've had this so problem with test and evaluation for self-defense systems for a while. Yeah, the, really bad. So the, res the response is modeling and simulation, right? And the problem is, it, no, but that doesn't capture it. You're absolutely right. I'm a model and simulator. I'm not saying it's the panacea because you have to have the analyst and the warfighter in there as well. It's not the right solution. So in a way, if we are able to build mm, uh, something that we can put at risk to test against and fight against, that would be a wonderful idea. But right now, we don't have the flexibility to do that. So we rely on modeling and simulation. The problem with that is, as you well know, uh, parameters, assumptions, scenarios, tactics, response, all have to be built in to a model and simulation. And I just told you the adversary is not going to think the way we think in some cases, nor act the way we think, and employ the way we think. 
So in that case, your modeling simulation by very nature is constrained by the people who are at the range of the parameters and tactics that you're naturally employing. So we have to have something that will allow us to first destroy things and see how well they work. And maybe what we really need, uh, my last command is somewhere deep in the Pacific Ocean um, after being hit by a bunch of missiles and torpedoes in a sinkex. There's no reason instead of you know, that occurring, uh, should have occurred maybe a test and evaluation uh, for swarms to see what the impact was. So it's a great question, a great challenge. And I think we face that every time before a national crisis. Okay. Thank you very much.